was on my hands, but the, the, the point here is that normally I give a presentation to give a, a presentation is to give you an idea. Is it just the moon we see every time it shows up in the evening, in the morning it is gone, sometimes it shows up in the morning, by lunchtime you can't find it, even sometimes lunchtime you find it. So it's all about uh, the sun, this is the sun, and then we have a lineup of planets. There are a bunch of other planets that we have been able to see. Previously, Pluto had been removed, but then they again included it. But also, there is another planet which they have seen beyond Pluto. So, we, in their order, I have not really bothered to make a macro like the one I told you about last time. I haven't coined out a macro that can be used to, 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 to define these. Uh, Planets or to make them in order, but you could try to move them just so you can figure out what you do. But there is the nearest, the sun is much more. You have Venus, you have we, the Earth, the Mars, which they call the red planet. We got Jupiter. Jupiter has just been, uh, has just been busted, as in they have just sent their Juno. Juno is J U N O is a satellite mm -hmm. which they have sent there. It can take photos. It can do some measurements. It can do profiling of the, uh, of the nature of Jupiter. Jupiter is the big boss in the universe. And then we have Saturn with Saturn rings. We have Venus and Neptune. This is an arrangement of how these planets, you know, spin and at what angle they spin. So we have much of spinning at point one. It tilts over for about 0.1 of a degree, then as once uh, again seven degrees, Earth tilts about 23.4 degrees, and then you got the uh, Mars 25, Jupiter 3 degrees. That's Jupiter only can tilt a bit of night we will be able to see Jupiter. So you'll be able to see that and say, I got it, I saw it, so I can see these lines here. And then the Saturn spins up 27, Uranus spins up to 98. Neptune Tare and Pluto 120 degrees. So this other thing here you are seeing is the same as that uh, receiver there. That uh, pole you see with uh, something on top. Mm -hmm. That something on top is this one here. And then the other morning I made sure that I look for the moon and uh, arrange the camera in such a way that the moon sits of the receiver. This is photography. So it doesn't mean that uh, when people say I am jobless, I don't have a job, you can just have the camera. The moon is there and a house, a building or a plant will be there or a flower. You make the moon sit on the flower and here you got the stuff which looks nice. You get a point. So it's all about how someone can be creative and take photos so you can create an employment or a job from using the normal objects. So I don't believe in people saying that there are no jobs or whatever. So next will be just to show you the, uh, uh, the, the arrangement of how these planets are arranged around the sun. So they move around the sun describing the path which we call an orbit. So the path described by a planet around the earth is what, I mean a sun is what we call an orbit. So this is the orbit for much more orbit for uh, Venus, uh, orbit for Earth. I hope I have not confused the orders. An orbit for Mars, orbit for Jupiter, Saturn. Um, this is, should be Neptune, and then Uranus, and then Pluto should be around there. But uh, the, 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 the universe is a uh, bunch of stuff up there. So we are in our solar system. What we call a solar system is like if you have families. Mm -hmm. So you start with a family where there is a father, mother, children, and then you get another family, other families, then you get a village, then the villages, you get a, a district, districts, you get a country, countries, you get a continent, continents, you get the world. Mm -hmm. That's the same kind of uh, perspective compared to when we talk about the universe. So I can just give a shot of that. 
So as you can see, the graphic is not so quick, but as you can see, this is how they should have completed this circle here. But this is how the planets should be moving. We got the uh, Jupiter also describing, but we are, are mostly interested in this place here, which is our uh, this is us here. Us, we, us. We, us, we stay on Earth. Okay? So this graphic just shows you how the planets spin around the sun. Okay? And then uh, the, 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 the data, some information about the uh, different planets. In the order from the smallest to the biggest, then you start with Pluto. Which Pluto is being the, the there's a lot of debate whether it should be really there or it shouldn't be there. So you've got Pluto, you've got Mercury, you've got Mars, you've got Venus, you've got Earth, then Neptune, Uranus, then Saturn, and huge biggest or biggest you get Jupiter as the huge man. But we are on Earth, so we are mostly interested in our little information. So we are about 149. Million six hundred thousand kilometers from the sun, or about one point zero zero astronomical units. We are about twelve point seven five in diameter. Twelve thousand seven hundred fifty six kilometers. If you change the meters, then you multiply by the uh, and mass. We are heavy as much as five point nine seven two exponential twenty four kilograms. Now, some people will say, but we are growing fat every day. We have a bunch of people who grow fat, who grow tall, who are born. There's nothing we get from out there. We eat the plants, we shit them, we shit the food we eat, so it remains here. So this is the mass we are. We have never gotten any other intrusion. So somebody may reason, you may reason out and say, but don't we get heavier at one point? We see the buildings coming up, we see the construction of houses, uh, construction of the roads. Can't we get a bit heavier? You are still getting it from Earth and it is still staying where? Earth. So that's why this mass is a constant. It's, that is the mass. You, you won't find it different tomorrow or you wouldn't find it different after a decade. Then we got the, uh, the, the next slide is about. Skeptical, the, the PC is a bit slow. Okay, so the, the, this is our Earth, and of recent they have discovered another another planet which mimics or which looks like Earth, which is called Planet X or Earth 2.0. It more or less looks like the Earth, probably, but it is far away, it is a couple of light years away from us. So this is just to show you how I came up with the other uh, fast fall I showed you with the moon in the sky and our GPS and just the camera so that they look as if they are. If, if you look at me now, if you look at me, I am here, yes. But if you try, if this box is here, you will be still seeing me, but with this one. If you move to this side, then my box will cover you, the box will cover me. If you move upwards, you will see me almost. That's the kind of dynamics of the camera. Then eventually you get something of the sort. In uh, this presentation, I started presenting this kind of uh, moon viewing presentations around 2014, after I had been in Pakwach in uh, 2013. That's when I started getting interest in uh, understanding what are the events available. So I found out uh, events of when the moon is very small, when it will be very big, the super full moon, how the National Space Station uh, be behaving, where you will see it, and where, what were the eclipses in 2014, and then what other astronomical events are available. The stationary showers are the uh, space walks which happen in the skies. And 
then there was an eclipse in 20, uh, in 20, I think 20, 2015 in, uh, in Nepal. I think so. It was in Australia, okay, in Antarctica. And these are the guys who were able to watch it. And uh, one would wonder how was the photograph taken. The photograph was taken by a rising satellite. So as the satellite is coming on the horizon of the Earth, it takes a shot. And he was able to take a shot of the annular. This is, had it uh, delayed a bit or had it been fast enough, this side will be able to this side. And the eclipse, which shows a ring of fire around the moon, But uh, this other uh, photograph is a photograph of another partial eclipse which was viewed in the United States. And this was, these were phases of that partial eclipse. And uh, currently NASA or the uh, National uh, Dynamic, uh, National Aeronautics Space administration, NASA, is working so hard to make sure that they can do science exploration and some technologies to make sure they can go to Mars and colonize it. So these are, this is the International Space Station, which is helping in doing experiments on how space affects human beings. And then we got these all rockets going to space. We have these robots. This is a curiosity. This should be a Something like that. I don't know, I'm not sure. But they, these are a bunch of rockets, uh, sorry, robots which are there. These are satellites which are going on. This will be Orion, spacecraft going there. And then this is a solar chip uh, propulsion uh, satellite. And then other technologies. And uh, Orion, which is a spacecraft, probably we shall be able to see the video for Orion. This is a spacecraft which was tested on the fifth. It was supposed to be fourth, but uh, they couldn't because of the weather forecast. And um, this is how it looked like. We have two rockets on, among it, and then actually three rockets, one, two, three. And then the Orion is just the other two. These ones will be separated later and go off. So this is eventually what will return to the Earth. So it didn't have astronauts in there. They had put in the astronauts. The, the, Computers to make sure that they can be the ones to help in, uh, in, uh, in, in taking measurements and taking a couple of measurements to show uh, what could be the conditions, what happens, the pressure, the radiation, EDC. Mm -hmm. and then they will, after coming back, they will be able to. So, this is just a module of the Orion. This part here is covered with. Uh, tiles for insulation. This is a, a, these are photographs about the uh, Inspire Discover. This is the uh, suit that will be used by the astronauts. This is the Orion itself. And this is just a graphic to show you this is an astronaut. This is a footstep of an astronaut. These are the, uh, tra the tire marks or the tracks of the uh, Curiosity. And this is an astronaut's helmet. And this is the suit. So NASA's journey to Mars. The journey for Orion will be, this is where Orion will be launched off. This is a launch system. This is Orion coming back in H1 mm -hmm. Yeah, so H1 is because when an object is going through a space of ions, uh, positive and negative charges, the, 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 the speed, its speed makes them so hot that it becomes plasma. And then you see something like fire. So normally what we see is that as the space rock is coming from space and goes through our atmosphere, reaching the ionosphere, which is a space of charge, that part of the, in those charges then gives us, I think it, is, it should be the mesosphere, then you see burning stuff. Then all of a sudden, disappear. You can't even hear whether it fell anywhere or anywhere because at that point you have passed through its region. And it wouldn't land far, it would have to land somewhere where it's got uh, these parachutes. And even when it has landed, 
they have some uh, buoyant like balloons around it, so it does not sink into the water. This is the surface of Mars, this is a guy doing the welding, doing the hard work, and this is the United uh, Launch System, I think launch uh, something ULL, which is, uh, so this is a close-up of how a launch system is, ULA is the United uh, Launching Alliance, something like that. And then you have Orion here seated, and this is a close-up of Orion, how it looks like where they seated. Another close-up, and towards the launching uh, time, then when they launch, when they spark it, they fire it up and it goes into space. We gotta do this around the equator so that you have the shortest distance to space. And this is how Orion goes into space, as you can see, it is already high in these clouds. And the American children, kids of Americans, or let's say kids of the West, they buy them things that matter, things that will add value. Not buying you a toy that you use to spray water on each other. It should be something that uh, inspires you. In the morning today I was listening to one of the astronauts on, on BBC and she was saying she preferred to be an astronaut when she was four years old. When the teacher said draw what you want to be, she drew an astronaut. So, yes, we, we would always uh, be able to draw what we have ever seen. I don't draw something you have never seen. So the only time when we try now to make sure that uh, you know, kids can be exposed to things that inspire them. Otherwise, I became a teacher because teachers were well off in my village. They had nice spice schools, right? That would start, they would put on nicely. If they are in the quarters, they had a big chunk of, uh, of land for tilling, or for digging. So, Maybe that's what made me stick to being a teacher. But this is a, a, a toy for American children to inspire them into space. This is an actual follower for Orion in space being tested. This is rocket propulsion here. It's still got fuel around here to propel it for, or you can, can use only this part with the, the solar panels to generate the fuel to move it. But the actual Orion is here. This is the part that you know goes off. So this is when it has detached already. We go to the part which is using these solar panels. Once you are above these clouds, you no longer have any shadow. There are no trees there to cover you up. So you are comfortable. You are sure that you will be able to uh, to to move at will using the electricity. So all the sunlight you will be able to be with you and then you can use that one that you saw my photos near a career bus which uses solar energy. So once you have all that power you store it in the, in the power bank and you can still fly anywhere you want. So eventually this would uh, detach itself off on the point at the point of return when it is going to come back for landing. And it will be okay this is its nature we call it a capsule. And then these are tiles for heat resistance. Because as it, if you were to, to be in a can, you put your hand outside and you leave it there. You would hear even, you would feel your hand is even going behind. And these are just air particles, air molecules, which are just here. Assume now this hand which is there is in a, a bunch of uh, electrons and positive ions. And it is going through them. That means it will, those ions will eventually make it. If you, if you, if you chop your hands like that, you feel the, the warmth of the hands. Mm -hmm. Meaning that anything, when you have kinetic energy lost into something, that energy has to be changed to something. Because we know that energy is never lost. It can only be changed from one step to the other. And then this is how this uh, Orion looks like when it is moving through those lines. Causes this kind of plasma around it. And uh, how they launched it? They launched it from the United States here. You see, it is almost uh, near the equator. When I say around the equator. So it had to make a journey around the Earth 
and then try to go deep into space to make sure that now they can get an experience of where it's going. And if you draw a graph, this is how it would go like. Um, and it was more or less like a textbook, whatever, because around the first test in December, it was a critical significant step towards sending humans further into space than ever before. This test will evaluate launch and high speed re-entry systems such as avionics, attitude, attitude control is when you tilt your phone and then the screen goes the other side. Mm -hmm. And so that, then parachutes for landing and the heat shield. So this flight test was to test a lot of stuff. What material can give good heat shield or heat uh, resistance? So this is how it looked like when it has just come back compared to before launching. So this is the same, if you look closely, this is not the same as this, but the most important thing is about the heat and that thing, the banter, they say the banner. Uh, Orion is getting ready to launch. My name is Kelly Smith, and I work on navigation and guidance for Orion. Orion is NASA's next generation spacecraft. Built with versatility in mind, it can take astronauts deeper into space than we've ever gone before, to an asteroid, or even onto Mars. For these missions, Orion has to be one tough spacecraft, withstanding high speeds, searing temperatures, and extreme radiation. Before we can send astronauts into space on Orion, we have to test all of its systems. And there's only one way to know if we got it right. Fly it in space. For Orion's first flight, no astronauts will be aboard. The spacecraft is loaded with sensors to record and measure all aspects of the flight in every detail. It all begins with launch aboard a Delta IV heavy rocket. As it punches into Earth orbit, Orion will jettison its launch abort system. The abort system is a safety feature designed to pull Orion and its crew out of danger if there were a problem with the rocket during ascent. Orion's journey is just beginning. As the spacecraft and the upper stage begin their first lap around Earth, Mission Control in Houston is monitoring the progress of the flight. Orion's over 100 miles up and going about 17,000 miles per hour. Just as it passes over the Indian Ocean, we lose communication. This is expected. The communications link we have through satellites to Orion is momentarily lost. But Orion continues to receive and process data. Its computers can handle 480 million instructions per second. Imagine you are traveling with Orion as the flight test continues. One orbit completed. Time to go. The upper stage of the rocket fires again. Like the setup for a roller coaster ride, this is the big climb we've been waiting for. We are headed 3,600 miles above Earth, 15 times higher from the planet than the International Space Station. As we get further away from Earth, we'll pass through the Van Allen belts, an area of dangerous radiation. Radiation like this could harm the guidance systems, onboard computers, or other electronics on Orion. Naturally, we have to pass through this danger zone twice, once up and once back. But Orion has protection. Shielding will be put to the test as the vehicle cuts through the waves of radiation. Sensors aboard will record radiation levels for scientists to study. We must solve these challenges before we send people through this region of space. For this flight, it's time to head home. The upper stage of the rocket triggers separation. Orion's jets fire to turn it into the proper position to re-enter Earth's atmosphere. No matter what happens now, 
we're coming in. 75 miles above Earth, the spacecraft enters the atmosphere. Things happen quickly. We're now traveling more than 20,000 miles per hour. Air particles pushed out of the way heat up. An envelope of hot plasma surrounds the vehicle as it plummets towards Earth. The plasma reaches temperatures of 4,000 degrees Fahrenheit, almost twice as hot as molten lava. This may be the most dangerous part of the flight. Mission Control is monitoring all the data from the spacecraft, and then we lose communication again. No data can penetrate the plasma. Orion is on its own. Orion is inside a fireball. Onboard systems ignite jets to keep the ship pointed correctly, so the specially constructed heat shield takes the full brunt of the inferno. This is the largest heat shield of its kind ever made. Orion's computers command the spacecraft to bank like an airplane, keeping a precise path to the landing site. Even though we've slowed from 20,000 miles per hour to about 300 miles per hour, we're still traveling amazingly fast. We must slow down to safely land in the ocean. Luckily, we have parachutes. Specially designed for Orion, the parachutes help us hit the brakes, but not too quickly. One day people will be aboard, so deceleration must happen in stages to keep things comfortable for the crew. Flight might be over, there is still a lot of work to do. Onboard sensors recorded every detail, from launch, to flying in space, to re-entry, to landing. Flight tests are difficult and complex, but they give us confidence that the systems we have designed work under real flight conditions. It's great to be a part of this first space flight for Orion, and we're looking forward to beginning a new chapter in human space exploration. So this is how Orion comes and uh, can put off the, uh, the, the panels and comes and docks on the International Space Station. This is the International Space Station. We shall see a bit of this is how it looks like. And so this is Launch America Commercial Group Transportation. The mission is inside. Soon, people who have a lot of money will be able to pay. He goes in the space shuttle, goes to space for like for a week. Also enjoys, runs around, takes selfies when he's hanging in space, and he comes back if they get money. So that's what you hear the word of commercial crew. So far, NASA does it for research. NASA has been doing all these sending astronauts into space. It was, has been for research, not for purposes. So this is the artistic impression of uh, how Mars uh, exploration will take place, or colonization, astronauts moving around with robots, trying to do experiments, having a station where they are staying with communication gadgets for sending back the information, and other robots to get them along the way. Uh, these are some ladies who are astronauts for purposes of uh, ladies being able to Space. This is Mars rover, the about one ton uh, rover or robot which was launched to Mars. It has a laboratory, it has these tires here, it has a, this robotic arm here which took the photo. It has the eyes here, it can send a laser and try to figure out. It can use its system here to pick some soil sample drill it and take it in there, run some. But it doesn't do it itself. Somebody on Earth, on the control in the United States, is able to send the, the, some information, some commands. Mm -hmm. So commands it, just like when you're on WhatsApp, you can say hi. You've typed hi on your phone. I, my phone vibrates. And then I get to know that you are saying. If you send a job, they will see me smile. The same thing. So you send a command when you are in the United States, it goes to the server which is orbiting the Mars, and then that server sends it to, to uh, Curiosity. Curiosity does what you told it to do. It drills the soil, it puts it in the lab, processes the runs a, a test, then produces results and sends the results. Or you tell it to take a photo. And you make sure it covers this much, it takes the photo, sends it through the satellite, from the satellite to the earth. Okay? So there is another shot now, here's the facing us and the clarity of the 
equipment all around here. And this was Mars, I mean this is Mars as of today, just the way we draw the Earth. And you see Africa here, the United States, Asia, Europe. This is the globe of Mars. But this is how it looked like in ancient times. So meaning that maybe we've been so careless that we have spoiled it. So that, so, so that we've lost all this water. Maybe if we continue being careless and being responsible, Earth may also end up uh, being like Mars and becoming a desert. After all, in the north of and the south, it has already started. These are all technologies that are on Mars, around Mars, taking different information. And if you were to be keen, you would be able to read each of these and what it does. This is marine and some marine, marine and something. And something. This is, uh, so each of these satellites take different information, and each of these robots here take different information on the surface of Mars. I will focus on the rocks. So these are the rocks on Mars, how they look like. On a scale of one centimeter, this is how they will have, uh, this is about half a meter. So this rock is about half a meter. This is a closer of the given rock. This is um, other rocks and a, a little bit of landscape on Mars. This is sunset on Mars. And uh, this, other, this is the landscape of Mars. And uh, this is another landscape. And, uh, just like you can take a photo of the same place but looks different. Okay? Mm -hmm. But these are definitely two different places if you look at them closely. Then you have another photo of the, the landscape of Mars, but with a close-up of a couple of rocks. And this is a selfie taken by the Mars rover, Curiosity. So it took a selfie like the Quasar. The, the time they took this selfie is the time when selfies became selfies, when it was the top of town. So the, the controller here, Mars also sent a command and said, Turn, made it to turn and take a given hour and give us a safety. This is a Mars uh, surface, but we what we call Aurora. Uh, maybe I will try to explain what an Aurora is. This was Messenger, and Messenger was supposed to be on, uh, uh, this was as of August of 2014. It crashed into, I think, Mercury, and these are statistics of what it had done, the, the information it had got. It had flown, had, had six flyovers on inner planets, it, has, it had had 35 million shots by the Mercury laser altimeter and EDC. So it was trying to orbit Mercury and trying to look at different things. These were astronomical events in 2015. I don't have those of 2016, but probably soon I will be able to update them. In 2015, there was an eclipse. I think you should have seen it uh, around uh, this one here. And this uh, eclipse here was in uh, parts of Sweden. Okay, even Norway they were able to see, but Sval, uh, Svalbard uh, Islands are ones who saw the total. So when you, when you see red, that's where the total eclipse is. Here you see the total eclipse, the ones which are orange are more than 90%, the yellow, dark yellow 90%, the yellow 40%, the other ones not visible at all. So all these countries, including Uganda here, yeah, we didn't have to see anything. Okay, we didn't see anything. So the, uh, the uh, eclipse, you could have another graphic to show you where you see this black dot, is where actually the total eclipse passed by. And this is the part here that is, was able to see a total eclipse. So anyone who could have been in a plane flying around here could see an eclipse without even fearing the clouds. You can do that 
from the clouds. And uh, unlike you guys here who just here are liquid and don't care, in the United States, in the uh, Europe, these are Norwegians. They were busy taking photos all through. You can see each other, everyone has a camera and they are deep into snow and they are comfortable and willing to, to watch. This is how an eclipse, a total eclipse looks like. The sun is behind there. The moon is able to cover the sun because if you see me, now you can see part of me. Okay, now you can see me with this covering just the nose. If I was to send it there, continue sending it there, eventually it will cover the whole of me because of the electric distance. So if you put your box in front of you, you wouldn't see nothing about me. If you push it away from yourself, you start seeing parts of me. If it was, to, if you could stretch it magically up to my nose, it may even maybe cover my mouth. Uh, so that's what, that's how the moon is able to. At this point of uh, eclipse, normally the moon is about 400 times near to the Earth. And if it is about 400 uh, miles near to the Earth, it means that it is able to cover the whole sun. But this is uh, what we call the corona, uh, corona part of the earth, I mean of the sun, that you are able to see these lights coming up like that. And uh, when, when, the, when the moon is approaching the sun, it means that if it was to be going away from the sun, you start by seeing the diamond ring, then eventually. So if you are very good at taking shots, photographs, you can sh get a nice shot of the actual diamond ring with the shiny part of the top and the other part of the ring. Okay, this is a, a shot which was taken with the moon covering, partially covering the sun on an eclipse, but the most interesting part was these, uh, these other images, the, the time-lapse or lapse uh, images where you take shots after intervals. So these were intervals of the National Space Station going around. And the National Space Station is just a, a chunk of you know modules, some components, some some housings put together, and then they are hanging up there 220 miles in space, 220 miles above the sea level. I'll show you what it is. So this International Space Station, okay, before I go to the International Space Station, the, the, the issue to do with the night and the day, and issues to do with eclipse and the like, it's all depending upon, upon the, uh, the sun, its sun rays, then the earth and how it spins. So the earth spins like that, yeah, and this is the equator where we live. And uh, we have seasons because of the sun, I mean the earth's movement, and this earth movement depends basically on as it is going at a given particular time, it is at a given position, and if you add on the tilt it gets of 23.4 uh, degrees, then if, if the earth is around here, these countries, the United States, Canada, Finland, Sweden, they say, they face away from the sun. They get cooler. We are feeling some cool environment now because there is, the place is cloudy. And because it has gotten cloudy, it will be cool. And when it gets cool, it means that if you didn't have any sun at all, because this part has still direct, then it becomes windy. On this other side, you have these parts uh, also still far away in the June. These parts of the United States face now the sun, becomes sun. In, uh, in September, you transit into uh, this should be autumn. What we call fall. Autumn, fall, winter, spring, summer, like that. So you, you have that sequence of autumn, winter, summer, spring. No, you, you have. Uh, Autumn, winter, then things spring up in the plants, then you go to summer. Autumn, winter, spring, summer. 
like that. I think we are as fake as we are because everything is okay. Everything is available. Like uh, we are trying to say in the morning. That for us, 6 a.m. in the morning is wake up. 6 p.m. is go to the house. So it's the same day and day in, day out. But if you were in these countries, this, it is not business as usual. In the winter, at around 2 or 3 p.m., the deep winter, the December, it becomes dark at 2 p.m. In the morning, it is dark until 10 to 11. So things have to change. You have now to start carrying the watch to know the time. Otherwise, you cannot say, oh, by the look of the sun, it's about to set, so that is 6 p.m. now. So then, but in summer, when it comes to June, countries like Norway, Finland, Sweden, or what we call the Scandinavia, it can reach up to midnight when the sun is just setting. And it sets for a couple of minutes, around 2 it is up again, 3 it is shining. So again, you can't say, that's why I think one of the, one, uh, one professor from the United States uh, couldn't teach him in Trumzo, in Norway, because it was day, all night, all day. They gave him a blinder, nothing. They got him hardcover uh, curtains to bring darkness in his uh, apartment, he refused. Things couldn't work for him, he went away. So in winter, you are always sleepy. It is dark, you want to sleep. Even it is so, so cold. In, in the summer, it is the reverse. The thing, you don't even feel any sleep up to midnight. So that's how things happen because of these seasons. Now, but all that comes about because of evidence. So someone will say that, okay. Say the earth is round. It should be a square after all uh, Galileo was killed because of the he was killed. Galileo was killed because the uh, he said the earth is round. They say no, it's a square. So he was <laughs> so in, in that perspective. The International Space Station is one of the available avenues now that someone who is so adrenaline can be taken there if it wasn't about the cost. So that he or she can be able to see how the world looks, I mean how the earth looks. And the International Space Station, as I said, is a bunch of modules. This is its robotic arm. But my interest is to show you that this, this horizon here shows you that the earth is, is round. Similarly, you also see it is round, the clouds are there, they do not escape. Anything that evaporates from the water surface here, either in the deck or sea, still comes back. Because in order to escape our atmosphere, you must have about 11 kilometers per second. What you will be taught as escape velocity. So in order for a rocket to be launched and escapes our atmosphere, maybe goes to heaven, if it is there, is that you have to use 11 kilometers per, per second. You can convert that how many per hour it be. And uh, so this is still modules, this is the sun. So this International Space Station was built by a bunch of, uh, a fleet of uh, space shuttles. There was Discovery, there was Columbia, which uh, got an accident and then body died. There was uh, Endeavour, there was, uh, oh, this is Discovery, Columbia, Endeavour. I don't remember the other ones, but I think there were a set of five, and uh, they did this for over 30 years. And they, they, they got uh, they got retired in 20 or 2012. 2011 or 2012. I have to make to, to get those uh, bets. I mean, those years again. So this also has uh, two rockets and also has a fuel. 
this is a, a fuel tank. So this one is propelled in space when it is about to reach the, 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 the end edge of the space to escape, then this one is detached and it comes back and lands in the Pacific uh, Ocean and they get it and repair it and reuse it. So are these ones. So we don't lose anything. The launching is near the water and it is calculated that by the time they are you know, detached off, they will be able to come back and land in the sea. When it, it lands back to the airport, it cannot now fly here on Earth and starts flying around moving from place to place. So what they do, they put it on, the, on this giant plane to be transported to other places. Most especially when they were transporting there, some of them to I think Kennedy Center, uh, Kennedy Space Center for either keeps or for repair or for position. They use this kind of plane transport. They also we are able to, to use the International Space Station to agree that the Earth is round. It's a round object. And uh, the, uh, the Earth, geographers talk of the iron core, then I don't know what this one they need, how they call it, and then underneath us we have this uh, magma here, this uh, molten magma, whereby whenever it gets a chance, it just spits out mm -hmm. and causes uh, volcanic mountain. So it comes out as a volcanic action. Then you get the Mugayungas, you get Kivu, you get all those mountains that, uh, that produce mountains. But actual, it's actual, it's a fact that the Earth is round by all measures. And uh, astronauts who have been on the International Space Station, most times, not most times, but at times they fly above the Earth, other times they fly below the Earth. And it is not a small thing. The International Space Station is not a small thing. As you can see, these uh, panels here are adjustable, depending on where the sun is. So they track the, the sun's direction to be able to provide efficient amount of... Uh, so it's a, a... The National Space Station is a bit lighter than a precise uh, soccer field. Soccer field is where the Americans play their football, what they call football much as they play it using the hands. I don't know why they call it a football. But fortunately enough, they call it soccer. You just see them running around with this ball which they throw and it spins and then another one drops it. And it's not like that. It's just like that. That's their football. So it's a size. This is uh, another graphic shows how it looks like from the other angle. And it, if you put it on the, that soccer pitch, this is how it looks. And the soccer pitch is about 100 by 50. Yeah. Hello, I'm Sunny Williams. I'm up here on the International Space Station. Now, I want to say where we are. So right now, we're in the Japanese laboratory. It's one laboratory out of many here on the International Space Station. It's actually on the left-hand side. If I was the International Space Station and I was flying through space like this, my left hand would be where the Japanese laboratory is. So now again, we're on the right-hand side, all the way on the right of the International Space Station. This is Columbus, the European module. It has science experiments all over. You can see it looks a little bit crowded. And here we do a lot of our medical experiments. So this is Node 2. This is a really cool module. Um, of course, most of these modules, you'll see they have four sides. Uh, and they're put together. That way we could sort of wa work on a flat plane, either a wall, a floor, another wall, or the ceiling. But, you know, again, all you have to do is turn yourself and your reference changes. The reason I'm bringing that up is because this is where four out of six of us sleep. And so people always ask about sleeping in space. Do you lie down? Are you in a bed? Um, not really, because it doesn't matter. You don't really have the sensation of lying down. 
you just sit in your sleeping bag. So here's one sleep station right here. I'm going in right now. You can follow me if you want. So I'm inside. It's sort of like a little phone booth, um, but it's pretty comfy. I've got a sleeping bag right here that we sleep in so we don't have a, sort of like a little bit of a cover. We don't fly all over the place. Um, but you know, you can sleep in any orientation. I have it sleeping, feeling like I'm standing up right now, but like you saw, I'm on the floor, but it doesn't matter if I turn over and I sleep upside down. I can't have it, I don't have any sensation in my head that tells me that I'm upside down, so it really doesn't matter. The sleep station is also like a little office. We've got a computer in here. As you can see, we've got a couple little toys. I've got some books, I've got some clothes, and other things that make it sort of like home. I'm coming out. And just for reference, that's one sleep station. This one's another right here. There's one on the ceiling, if you want to call it, right here. And then there's a fourth on the other wall over here. So all of us sleep in a little bit of a, a circle. All right, come on back. There's more to show you. in the U.S. laboratory. Again, this is a laboratory with science experience on all of the walls here, all sorts of stuff that we do. Um, and one of the things we also do is we exercise. We have some exercise equipment on board the space station. Um, we need to do that because we lose bone density and muscle mass while we're up here, and that's a result of not having to fight against gravity. So how we keep ourselves in shape are with a bike, a treadmill, and a weightlifting machine. This is the bike. You notice the clip pedals. So all you need to do is actually clip your feet in, and then you can start pedaling. You don't need a seat, because you don't sit down. Actually, I haven't sat down for six months now, so you don't need any, any type of seat. Just make sure you're, you're held in with your pedals. You probably see that the bike bounces around a little bit. As I move it, it's not steady and held to the wall firmly. And the reason for that is the space station is pretty big. You saw that there's also solar arrays on the space station. If we start putting any forces into the space station, it's going to make those solar arrays bounce around a little bit. So to prevent that, the machines bounce around a little bit, move around a little bit. And that way, we don't put any forces onto the structure of the spacecraft out to the solar arrays. All right, a little farther on. Come on. Here's a pretty cool place. This is sort of like in your house where everybody meets in the morning. Uh, after you wash your face, brush your teeth, you want to find something for breakfast. And this is our kitchen. You might notice there's all sorts of foods here. Uh, it's like opening the refrigerator. You got all your different stuff that you want to have. Drinks, meats, eggs, vegetables, cereals, uh, bread, uh, snacks. And that's a good place. That's where you find all the candy. Uh, side dishes and then some little power bars just in case. So we have all this type of food. Some of it is dehydrated and so we have to hydrate it, fill it up with water. Some of it is all ready made and then all we have to do is heat it up. So something like this, I'm pulling out barbecued beef brisket. Pretty yummy. Not only is this food made in the U.S., but we also have food here from Japan. Uh, we've got Russian food. As you can see, all these red containers are filled with food that's from Russia. Um, and then we get some of our specialty stuff, some things that we like, some of our favorite stuff that your family can send up. In fact, I like fluffernutters, and so I got sent up some fluff so I could make my fluffernutter with peanut butter. So you have a lot of food up here, no problems. I'm here with my two buddies uh, in the airlock. 
Actually, these are two spacesuits uh, that are ready, primed up to go outside, as we call it, to go do a spacewalk in case we have to do anything outside. Some of the things we do outside are just like inside repairs. We have a lot of um, electrical boxes and machinery and solar arrays, in fact, that I talked about earlier, that are outside, and sometimes they don't work quite right. Um, remember, space is really cold and really hot, and it's also the vacuum of space with no pressure, and so some of the equipment doesn't work well all the time. So we might have to go out and do a spacewalk. Right behind me is actually the hatch that you go out into space, and right now we have it filled up with a couple other spacesuits because we've got four of them up here uh, and some of our tools. But right behind here is the hatch in which you actually go right outside into the vacuum of space. The spacesuit is pretty big, as you can see. It's like being a football player. Um, part of the reason it's so big and bulky is because of this backside, this backpack. It's like going on a hike with a backpack, but the backpack and the suit weighs about 300 pounds. Luckily, in space, nothing really weighs anything, so you don't feel that it's so heavy. But we need to have such a big suit because that guy back there is essentially um, the, the heart of the spacecraft. This I call this actually a spacecraft. It has all the oxygen for you. It has all the carbon dioxide removal system for you. It also has a heating and cooling system to make sure to regulate our body temperatures while we're outside. It also has a computer. So it tells you on a display here if there's anything that's going wrong with the suit, if we're running out of oxygen, if we have too much carbon dioxide, um, or any type of electrical problem. So it's a pretty awesome little spacecraft, and uh, actually got to go out, use my spacecraft, little spacecraft, a couple times, and it worked like a charm. Uh, lucky that it works very nice. You might want to see what the helmet looks like. It's pretty cool, too. We don't usually go out like this, so you usually can see when the helmet's open. So you can see what it looks like inside. Somebody's little head would be inside of here. So you can see, you can turn your head all the way around while you're inside of there, but the helmet stays still. So that's uh, determined your, your, how far you could see. And uh, it's usually pretty sunny out there, so we have to wear our sunglasses. And this is our sunglasses right here, which make you look pretty cool. <laughs> here we are at the throne. This is awesome. You might see the little, um, you might have noticed the little moon on the outside. This is our orbital outhouse right here. And of course, it serves for two functions. Number two, right here, I'll show you. But you see it's pretty small, so you have to have pretty good aim, and you'll be ready to make sure things get let go the right direction. And it smells a little bit, so I'm closing it up. And that's, of course, for number two. And this guy right here is for number one. So they're sort of two slightly separate functions, but you can do a little, essentially both, by hanging on right here and doing number one and number two. I might add it's color-coded, so you really don't get it mixed up, which is nice. This is yellows for number one. And also, there's a selection of paper. People always ask about toilet paper. What do you do with toilet paper? What kind of toilet paper do you have? We have gloves just because sometimes it does get messy. We have some Russian wipes, which are a little bit coarse if you like the coarse type of toilet paper. We have some nice tissues, which are nice and soft if you like soft toilet paper. We have huggies um, just for any cleanup. You know, we were all babies once, and this sort of helps. And then if things get really out of control, we have uh, disinfectant wipes just to make sure we clean up here. Because, you know, just like the water, I showed you the number one stuff can sort of go all over the place if you don't aim correctly. And did I mention both of these have a little bit of suction, so they should keep things going in the right direction. But um, like I said, sometimes things get a little out of control if you are out of control yourself flying around. So we have lots of protective stuff. And of course, you do have your privacy. There's a little door. So other people know that you're in there. Now, I'm gonna take you to one of the coolest places on the space station.
It's like a glass bottom boat. This is the cupola. It stick, sticks down below the uh, space station. Uh, it's one of those places you find yourself hanging out in all the time because all you want to do is look back at our planet. I think some questions I had were about what do you do in your free time? And you can't help but want to just come to the cupola and, and look outside as much as you can. And a lot of folks, I, I play this game with myself about where we're flying over the Earth. I try to come in here and just guess. After being here for a little while, you can sort of figure it out. You can tell different cloud types over different continents. You can tell different soil types over different continents. So let's see. And then, of course, there's a lot of ocean. So usually we're over the ocean at first glance. I will tell you in just a moment where we are. There we go. Oh, right now we are right over Africa. It's a little bit cloudy, as you can tell, but we're right over the continent of Africa. Hey, what's that? I think that's a Soyuz spacecraft. That's the spacecraft that's taken us home to planet Earth today. Oh my gosh. We might have to go take a look at that. That's pretty cool. It's a little bit smaller than the rest of uh, the spacecraft, the space station, so you'll see um, if we get, go there, it'll be a little bit more crammed. But we're going, you can look all the way back to the back of the spacecraft, which is where the Russian segment is, and then you can look all the way forward to uh, the front of the spacecraft, where the, uh, where the Japanese laboratory, the European laboratory, and the American laboratory Hey, one thing I didn't show you, or I talked about, but I didn't show you, was the exercise, one of, another piece of exercise device. This is what we call the A-RED. And with this, you can lift weights, ooh, based on vacuum in these cylinders, just like you do at home at a gym. For example, if I wanted to do a squat, I could do it like this. Need some weight on this thing. I'm not lifting with anything, so it's sort of it's too easy. <laughs> One of the cool things you could do, you could do things that you can't do at home. For example, single leg squats with just one leg, because the other leg you won't fall over. So all sorts of stuff. You can also do bench press. We have a bench that we could add on here. So you can work on your beach muscles. <laughs> All right, I showed you the Soyuz. Let's go check it out. Hey, Aki, what are you doing down there? Smashing things. <laughs> this is one of the cool things about space, too. It sort of looks like there's a big old hole here but you don't even think twice about it. You can just jump over the hole, or if you want, you can go jump into the hole. I'm coming down. Right. Come down. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> then you can come right back up again, like Superman. lucky we have a really cool big space station that you can fly around in. That's actually called the PMM. You might have saw it out the window. It's a big silver canister. What's really great about that is it's essentially our closet in our pantry or whatever you want to call it. We have extra food down there. We have extra clothes. We actually throw the trash out down there. So it's nice and organized and we have all of our stuff that we need while we're working in all these other modules all stowed in this location down here. And it's a lot of fun to play in. Now that's a lot bigger than the, the Soyuz. Oh, one thing we need to show you is our patches here. While we've been up here, we've been Expedition 32 first, and then just recently we're leaving, we'll be, we were Expedition 33. And uh, there's all the crew members who are up here with us right now. Uh, myself, Yuri Malenchenko, Aki Hoshidi, if you can read Japanese. Uh, Yevgeny Turalkin, if you can read Russian, Oleg Novinsky, and Kevin Ford, who just took over as the commander of the space station and will be the commander for the next couple months. And he, by the way, is behind the camera right now. So you can say, hi, Kevin. <laughs>
<laughs> so we're going into the Russian segment. Be ready. You don't need a passport either. It goes a lot farther back than this. Uh, we'll go take a trip and say hello to the boys down there in just a minute. Well, let's do that first, actually, and then we'll go down to the Soyuz at the very end. This is Yevgeny. Hi. Doing a little tour. <laughs> this is the FGB, and what's cool about this module, it is actually the very first piece of the space station that came up in 1998. The space station has been around for about now um, manned for 12 years, but it's been up in space for about 14 years. And this was the very first. It is like the Russians' PMM. It has a lot of storage, as you can see. So here we are in the heart of the space station, really. This is the service module. This is the central post. In case we had any problems, I know one, a couple of the questions were about what type of things do you have to worry about? And some of the things we have to worry about in space are fire, if we had a fire, if we had a depressurization, like we were hit by a micrometeorite and it made a hole, or if we had some type of toxic atmosphere. We use ammonia for our radiator, so there is a possibility that ammonia could come into the vehicle, and then it would be bad for all of us. If we have any of those problems, we come right here, which we call the central post. It is the main heart uh, of the space station. It was also the first computers that came up here that ran the space station. And so behind this wall right here are these main computers. So we gather here as a group of three or six and then figure out how we're going to either fight the fire, patch the hole, or solve the, uh, the toxic spill. And what's cool about this module, of course, it's the central post. It also has uh, great windows right down toward Earth. It has uh, controls to fly in uh, visiting spacecraft if they need uh, some assistance right here. It has Russian computers as well as American computers to help us control anything we need to on the space station. It's a couple of our crewmates back there, Oleg, Oleg Novinsky on the right and Yuri uh, Malenchenko on the left. And there's also a second bathroom here, which is really cool because six of us going to one bathroom is really tough. And so there's one bathroom here and one bathroom on the other side where I showed you. And you can probably see on the wall behind Oleg and Yuri some of the heroes of the space program. Um, Korolev, Sergei Korolev, who was a chief designer of putting men into space. And of course, on the right-hand side, Yuri Gagarin the first man to go into space. So just keep reminds of, of our roots. I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop here just for a quick second. You can see on the Russian spacecraft, there's also other modules that stick out, down, and above. Uh, right here is, let's see, I'm trying to be oriented. That's a, a, um, a place where we do spacewalks run for the, Russians, for the Russian side. There's Russian spacesuits in here. And also a visiting vehicle which brought fruits and vegetables and becomes a trash container when we undock. Up on this side is also a future place where they're going to do spacewalks from. And connected to it is Kevin's, Oleg's, and Yevgeny's uh, um, uh, Soyuz spacecraft. And now let's go see ours. Извините. No problem. Это пробка. getting in here. <laughs> this is the docking
connecting probe right here, this big thing. This helps us connect to the spacecraft. This probe actually sticks into this cone. And that's how the spacecraft, this, our Soyuz, becomes connected to the ISS initially. That is then replaced by clamps, which are around here, that will allow the two spacecraft to be stuck together. And then you can remove the, the probe and the cone. So here we are in the Soyuz. This is what we call the Bet-O, the living compartment, Bitovoy Atsek in Russian. Um, it also has a little bathroom. It's not as good as the other bathrooms. So we try not to use it too much. It has drinking water in it if we need something to drink. And then, of course, it's filled up with a lot of cargo uh, for us. Um, for us bringing up and also bringing back down. It has a second purpose when it comes back to Earth it serves as a um, garbage container. During the descent, we'll, we'll get rid of this, con this area right here and everything that's in it will just burn up as it's coming into the atmosphere so that way we can get rid of a little bit of trash. But the main area where we were on launch and where we are going to be on descent is down here because we're not part of the trash. So we're in a safe place. So we're in the descent module, SI. It's a little small. But you can get in. <laughs> Not sure how well you could see in here. Hold on for a second. I'm going to turn it up this way, just so you could see the hatch, and you could see Kevin. <laughs> it's a little bit small, but we'll We'll come in and show you around. We're just starting to get ready. We pre were preparing a couple days ago for our ride home. It's a little bit squishy, but everybody asks, how do you sit in the Soyuz? And you sort of sit in your seat like this. The seat is molded to your body, and so you can just sort of squish in here and be pretty relaxed. Everybody has a handmade seat for them. And then, of course, there's a control panel, and that's where we do most of our actions and work right here. There's hand controllers, which you can fly the vehicle with, and there's a stick right here, primarily used for communications uh, when we're trying to talk to the ground. So three of us fit in here. Like I said, it's a little squishy, but uh, somehow it seems like we all managed to get in here and, and fit pretty well, and it's a pretty safe ride home. You're probably wondering, what's all this junk behind us? Well, it's all of our parachute, first of all, and then it's all of our survival gear, just in case we end up landing in some strange place on the planet and nobody's there to rescue us right away. We have all sorts of survival gear uh, with us, keeping us safe in here. So they've pretty much thought of everything. And uh, we'll be home on the planet within the next 12 hours. Pretty shocking. <laughs> now, astronauts are trained using the water, big uh, swimming if you watch uh, the movie called Amogere, you will be able to see how those uh, astronauts were. Those guys who were dreaming, uh, who were working at an oil company, how they were integrated and trained on how to, do the, uh, to be astronauts. So you go in your space suit, space suit should be sealed everywhere, so it means you wouldn't care about the water. But this is how, if you wanted to experience the... If you wanted to experience the, the concept of weightlessness, then you go in a swimming pool. If you go in a swimming pool and you are there, you cannot walk like this in a swimming pool and you feel comfortable. Or in the neck. You, the moment you start doing that, they see you now floating in the, in the water. So that's why when you are with a friend in the swimming pool or in, in the water, you try to make sure that your feet, if you are on the shallow side, you make sure that your feet are on the floor. That's where you can easily go. That's how also astronauts move. So in 2015, Kelly, when he was, I think, was. Uh, it was launched late 2014. No, either in 2015 and came back. I think it was launched in 2015 
and then he came back in, uh, in 2016, I think in March. He's called uh, Scott Kelly. He has a twin brother called Mark Kelly. And uh, he had to spend a year in space so that they can investigate how does space affect people's bones or flesh or blood or whatever. And uh, it is uh, believed that he grew a bit taller by a couple of inches, I think 125. And he spent there one year and one year would be able to, he would have moved around the earth close to the distance that he would take to go to, to Mars. So he went, he flew with uh, these two Russians and if, before you fly to space, you have to sign some agreements. So he had uh, on, uh, on that mission of signing a couple of agreements, probably they will tell you if you die there, we shall take all the property. I don't know. Whatever they were saying. But uh, Scott Kelly was able to see 10,944 sunrises and sunsets, and during, this would be during his year in space, if you went to, to Twitter and you look for, or even Facebook and you look for this hashtag, year in space, you'll be able to get a recap of all the information that was shared about his mission, you know, year in space. For us, we only see about 684 sunsets, but for him, you will see 10,944 in one year. And the International Space Station travels about 7,500 miles per hour, and that means that it orbits the Earth every 90 minutes. So every 90 minutes, the International Space Station has already gone around the Earth. 90 minutes. And this will give about uh, 16 sunrises and sunsets each day, then you do the math of uh, the year, which is about 365. So if you go to NASA.gov forward slash one year, you'll be also able to get some information about uh, the, uh, the year in the space mission. So he's with uh, Scott Kelly, with his Russian friend, Kovic. And uh, Kelly would be, would be, or was able to look at, to see, sorry, to travel, in that he was orbiting the Earth, uh, going around the Earth every other night was able to move about 143 million 640,000 miles during his year in space. He was conducting space, uh, research to prepare us for our journey to Mars. And uh, which is about, the journey to Mars is about uh, 3,640,000 miles less, which is then 140 million uh, miles so in the National Space Station, this is again another small information to give, to give you a perspective of what his travel means. And uh, there is uh, water is a precious and limited resource in space. So in the National Space Station, crew members recycle uh, whenever it is possible. And uh, this includes even recycling their units. So they met in a, in a very nice place to make sure that they can recycle their pee for this part. So because Kelly would have to, uh, had to use 730 liters of recycled sweat and even during this in space. And this is when they were now heading for launch, for the launch mission. And uh, this is where the, the, where the rocket is launched. And uh, they were launched in this rocket. Here is uh, Scott in space trying to take a couple of shots and he was uh, pondering that he had been in space for three days and if he was to be on a mission to lunar orbit, that is to the moon's orbit, he would be already arriving. And if he was to be on a Mars mission, he would have uh, a couple of two, six, seven days to go. That was then. Time when this photo was taken. And uh, you could uh, follow him on Twitter, station CDK, RK, or you just follow the hashtag. This is his uh, Instagram, but this is for 
national awareness space. You get more information about uh, what it is. Or you can uh, use the hashtag gender to Mars. So this is Kerry in space. He was giving himself a shot. This is the inside of the space station. They were able to grow some plants there and monitor how they behave. Do they also have leaves which are going upwards? Do the leaves go downwards? Do the plants become short? Because there is no gravity, there is no gravity. Do they become taller? Because there is no gravity. So they were trying to look at all those. Because if you are going to go to Mars and try to grow food there and other activities, you need to know how those different things work in the space. And you can only do that in the International Space Station. So this is a, a nice uh, flower uh, which was uh, grown in space and it came with, uh, I think, some. And uh, the other one should have been, I don't know exactly what the other photo was about, I mean, the video was about. But this is the moon, this is how the moon was. Tonight the moon will be a little bit larger, maybe up to here. But these are the craters which are created after space junk or space rocks hammer it. But this photo here is basically to show the transition of the National Space, uh, space Station across the, uh, across the moon. And this is a photo taken by a satellite of the moon up there in space, another photo. This is a photo showing the uh, sunset and the new moon still in the, uh, when the photo is taken from space. I should have uh, a 2016 uh, calendar, but this is a calendar to show you different days of different month for different month for a given year like now 2015 and showing you exactly when is the moon new this part here and when is the moon full this part here and this part here ok so what's up January this was supposed to be January and uh, January I gave this uh, this uh, presentation but this is to show you can go on the internet and find out when the moon is setting when it is rising and the exact time and uh, the distance um, from the Indian person and what percentage of the moon is in the middle. Now, what the hell, or why the hell should we care about the moon? The moon is the influence of a couple of things. First of all, it protects us from the space rocks, space junk. What should have come and just come to us and hit us, it just goes for the moon and boxes it. Because when they come, they, they, when they come, they are at large. When they go near the moon, they get attracted to the moon before they actually get attracted to the earth. Because the moon, when you have two bodies, gravitation dictates that, or the law of gravitation states that any two bodies attract each other and the force of attraction is proportional to the to their mass and inversely proportional to the product of their mass and inversely proportional to the distance between them. So when these rocks are far away, no problem, but when they come nearer, the force increases and then they, they start hitting the moon. That's why we got those uh, craters. So it protects us in one way. The other way is that when the moon is either full moon, full moon means that the earth is here in the middle, the sun is this side, and then the moon is this side. Remember, the moon does not produce uh, its own light. It only reflects the light from the sun to the earth. So if we are the earth, it is in the night here, day for these people, so the sun has disappeared this way. We see, because the moon is somewhere that far, we see the, all the sunlight reflected back to earth and you get a full moon. But that means that you have the, the sun this side, you have the moon this side, and then they shake the earth. When the earth is shaking, then we get what we call the tides. When the tides, if you were on a beach, you would see water coming. 
on the shore. This water here, when it comes on the shore, it doesn't all go back. If it is sunny and it is hot, some parts of this water evaporates. And that's why either in full moon, like now, full moon will be on the 20th. But as you can see, we already have uh, some, some clouds. But on the new moon, apart from this new moon, really, of uh, this ED, I did see the rain. But mostly on the, on the new moons, you will get a drizzle late in the night, 3 a.m. there. Because what would have evaporated from here will condense. After condensing, it drops back. Then we got the. Uh, it's all about the. So, if the moon was staying out of space, would the rivers and earth flow? We may even fly away. They will flow, but you see this, uh, these uh, tides, if I didn't say the word tides, these tides which you hear is not. The river doesn't flow because of that. But they only. Tides only make the water ping pong on the uh, shore back, and whenever it is going back to the lake, you don't get all of it going back. But what is left evaporates, and every time it evaporates in the night, then it collects. That's why um, lake regions, regions around Lake Victoria, when they are announcing the weather forecast, they say it will be some rains around the Lake Victoria Basin. It's because of this effect. I haven't, I've never been to Mombasa, maybe in future I'll get there, but they say in Mombasa, at one point in the year, you find that the shore is like here. At another point in the year, the shore is five kilometers deep into the water. Because of this effect of So it's all about uh, the sun, the moon, and the earth. These are the three bodies that uh, uh, help us. So comparatively, if you look at the moon and compare with the numbers of the, the numbers, this is the diameter of the moon, and then this is the diameter of the earth. But uh, the, on graphically, on scale, or to scale, this is actually how the moon uh, compares with the earth. On scale, this is in reality. Mm -hmm. This is a photo which was taken by a satellite as the moon was going around or going past the earth. So comparatively, this is, so you will probably stick in about uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, maybe 15 moons in one earth. And this is what happens. What happens is that you have the earth which is spinning about its axis, tilting 23 degrees, at least at one point, and then you have the moon going around it. So what happens is that you have also the sun spinning about its own axis for 11 years something we call the uh, solar cycle. So for example, between 2008 up to probably 2013, 14, 15 there, we were, we were subsiding into the minimum, whereby the maximum should have been around, uh, uh, the maximum should, be, should have been around 2011, and that's why we had a lot of light. But people haven't agreed that, or people haven't been, uh, they haven't accepted that actually when you look at the, the, the causes of lightning, space, space charges, which we call space weather, is also an effect. And they are always produced from the sun due to the, uh, due to the, when you have sunspots and then they spew out uh, particles, which we Always the sun produces solar wind. If you are on a campfire, you see plants leaves shaking because of the plasma. Fire is plasma. 
So, and that fire produces a solar wind. It produces a wind. So the sun produces that wind always. And that wind always blows towards us. But then anyway, the moon will go around the earth for about uh, for about 30, 30, 30 days. And the two of them should be able to go around the earth. So you have 12 months in a year. It's not so accurate. It's not so accurate. But as you can see, if I type on one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. Thirteen, twelve, so close, okay? Actually, it should be 13, but we know that we have 12 months, isn't it? Okay, so basically, I have already talked about this, isn't it? Mm -hmm. The different seasons, we have the sun there, and then the earth is not, it does not spin in the vertical direction, in the vertical position all time through. It tilts at one point, and after tilting, then we get, uh, that's why the seasons come up. And this is, this is another part showing the solstice, solar solstice, autumn. So I remember we said this will be autumn, the winter, then this will be spring, summer, will be these are dates to show you. 21st December, you have this in one line. The sun, moon, I'm sorry, the sun, sun and earth in a straight line along this point will give you the the winner, then here you have the, 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 auto, the spring and auto, and here you can take the summer. Oh, now I'm ready. Now you click. Mm -hmm. yes. Then we got the, another one with the winner solar stars, round equinox, then autumn and equinox, and summer solar stars. And these are all the solstice. These ones are all Now, the, the rationale is that the moment that the earth spins, I mean tilts, and comparatively look at the line, 
then these countries here will be away from the sun and these countries will experience the winter. The ones down will experience the summer. Six months later, when you are on the other side, then you get these countries facing the sun, becoming a winner. And then you have the other ones becoming summer. And uh, it doesn't only occur for the earth alone. It also occurs for the, uh, these other objects, the asteroids and the, the other space objects. So we have this part being in the winter. Six months later, the reverse happens. These other parts here face the sun, become summer winter. Comets also experience the winter huh? and the sun. This is a, a, an actual Google, uh, Google Earth now. Google Earth is able to give you cellular images up to the level of resolution of about 10 meters to a given uh, about one kilometer. It's up to you to you can zoom up to a given number of up to I think uh, 100 meters. If you have a good picture that was taken from a given location by the satellite. So if you look at the Earth uh, using Google Earth extract, this is a screenshot of Google Earth. You have these countries here. I will show you the stretch better. These are the Dakar, Senegal, Libya, Egypt, and then you have this part here, Somalia, and then you have the Middle East. These are in desert places simply because they are illuminated all the time. Also you have the Kalahari Desert down there. And then you have this stretch. But you can see the Congo Basin and then you have Red Victoria and then you have Uganda. The reason why we are blessed we are the part of Africa is because this whole stretch, much as we are on the equator where we should be harassed by the sun and probably dry out. But because of this large area of water, this water, after it has evaporated, then you have these winds coming up and bringing us the rains. So they blow on the Kenya, what they call the monsoon winds, and end up here, uh, giving us a lot of rain in that place. Otherwise, this whole place will eventually become very dry. But you can see this stretch, there is nothing to blow. Maybe in geography they don't show you anything. There is nothing here which you can blow to give you those winds. Everything, is, if it is dry, it is dry. There is no water, nothing. Whereas here you have a chance that this uh, small evaporation around here and this other part. So if I can make it a little bit more, you can now get a perspective. That these are our countries here in the in Africa and Middle East. You have part of, of India. India, part of the northern India, normally gets hot that people die because of the heat wave. But it's like people don't really take time to understand the dynamics of what happens here. But if you go to parts of North Korea, the Japan is somewhere there. India and North Korea. You North Korea and South Korea are not that cold because of the, of the winds which come there. Now, the Russia and EDC, Russia and then Europe and then you have Norway and the most Scandinavian countries are also lucky because of this, these water bodies which blow in here and give them the... But so it is not, there is no... Maybe the craziness I see in the Middle East here these countries, one needs to know their environment, the effect of the environment and weather to their problems. They are frustrated because of these problems here. So we may need maybe to chop here, we remove these countries, we blast it, <laughs> and we create some, uh, some, some you know, winds to be able to give this part. Or we all, we all shift to this side and make it tilt. It's a crazy idea. I'm just thinking, but you now are able to see the perspective. So the reason why these countries on top experience winter, this is Iceland, which is on the pole. The pole is around there. So these countries are near to the pole. So whenever they tilt away from the, the sun, they are actually far away from the sun. So you get winter, and all these countries be covered by by 
it's not. Canada this way, then Norway, Russia, then China also gets some experience of, of that. But compared to the other bottom of the earth, on the other side, you have all this having nothing there. So if there was any country around here, it would be able to have an experienced winner. Australia does not experience any rain, never gets any snow, and as you can see, it's dry because it is far away from the pole. So it's Cape Town, but Cape Town or this part of South Africa experiences a bit of rain. So when the other countries now are in the summer after they are tilted towards the sun, then South Africa gets away from the sun, but it won't be as snowy or it wouldn't get that much snow like <coughs> the other countries are getting. So this is South, South America, Australia, and this is called the Antarctica. Whereas the other one here on top, the one on top is called the Arctic. Uh, Arctic circle. This one here is the Arctic circle. And then this one here down is the Antarctica. So basically it is all about the the earth has seasons because of the axis is tilted at uh, about 23.4 degrees and we rotate about the axis and uh, we orbit, the earth orbits the sun but uh, the axis always points in the same direction so as you can see we, we, we are not tilting when we are, we, are not, we do not spin so when we are vertical we spin, like this. yes we spin, no 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 it spins like and this. In the spinning, but compared with the, um, it, I'm it, trying it, to look at the axis. Yeah, it. so it goes spinning at the axis tilted. Like it is it is going like this. So when you are here in December, at this point these countries are away from the sun. It comes uh, to the to the March, then the, the country these countries are still away from the sun. It comes to June, then the, the sun starts pointing at them. Then we get summer. We come to December to September, they start now getting away from the sun, which is around here. And then we get to December, it becomes true winter. And so these are the diff the, the north, and then you have southern hemisphere where you get the Coriolis force, if you will maybe see northern hemisphere. Summer of the equator in the north, and then the summer shines directly on the southern part. The sun shines on the southern part and gives it the, uh, the, the, the summer. And then uh, in March, you have a fall for the south of the equator, spring north in the equator. The sun shines equal on the southern and northern in March. And then in June, you have the uh, winter south of the equator, summer north of the equator, and the sun shines directly on the northern part. September, spring, south of the equator, you know, fall of the equator, and the sun shines equal on the south and northern hemispheres. So, which is really demonstrated by this. You have this, you have the, so here is winter in December, you have the other side. And this is another graphic just to let the point sink home in the winter, where you only measure the winter away from the sun because of the tilt. Here yeah, also another one to show you that nights are longer days than we get the nights get longer. And then you have days getting shorter in the summer. And in, uh, in the autumn, then uh, in the winter, the nights get longer and the process goes like that. And, and if it is summer, everything gets out on a place. It gets fun. But if it is winter, some people can find fun in snow. And they go out and do skiing and you know, go cross country skiing. Others can go and play around with this white snow everywhere. And uh, this is to show you how it spins. It is spinning about its axis, but uh, as it spins, as you can see, it is tilted all through. Okay? And it is all about uh, the sun rays, where they heat, you get the day. Where they are not available, you are in the night. So these things.
But on the day and night, on the lunar surface, constantly changes. You refer to the percentage of the illumination of the visible face of the moon as the moon's face. And there are eight major named uh, phases that have been known throughout human history. So, if this is a uh, moon, which is uh, the side which we normally see is this one, and the hidden side of the moon is the other one. Yes. So, basically, we have a new moon which we can't see. This is the moon moves down here. This is what I want you to explain here. Why we call it a new moon is that when it reaches here, when it is inside here, for example, in here, when it is around here, yeah. it means the light is hitting on it and coming back inside. So we who are here, we wouldn't see anything when we are here. We can't see anything coming back here. Mm -hmm. That's when it becomes a new moon. But when it is this far, this other far side here, we call it far side here. It means that the light from here hits on the moon here and we get all of it reflecting back to us. Mm. As we move, we have a crescent at the horizon. We have a first quarter, it means a slice like half of it. We have a waning, uh, I mean a waxing gibbous, the one which we are, we are going to see today mm. is a waxing gibbous. Of course, the transition is not just from here to here. It keeps enlarging until when you have this distinct uh, form. And then here it becomes a full moon. And then it starts, you know, uh, it starts decreasing again proportionately to the, the waning gibbous. Then it becomes a quarter, a uh, last quarter. It is a quarter because much as this whole half here of the ball, but we can only see its quarter here. If it is uh, an orange, mm -hmm. we, if we slide sit here, that's half. But again, we are only seeing one part here, so it's like slicing it again, mm -hmm. so we see the quarter. So this is the first quarter, then here this will be the last quarter. Okay? And then it becomes a waning crescent in the morning, normally seen in the morning. You see, in the, in the night when it's a new moon, this side, it looks like this. When we are this is again a graphic which shows you when the sun has set, the, if, if this side will be the one, well, I mean, when we have the sun here, it means that uh, when we, it is at night, like here, where we are, tonight, you will be able to see the moon, when it is full moon, this sunlight will be hit here, be reflected back, then we see the whole moon. And then these are the other different different phases or different percentages of illumination. And this is another graphic to show you more, more nicely drawn graphic to show you. And when the sun has set and we have been having a new moon in the sky, that's when we start seeing this part here. But you are also able to see some chimo on the, the whole ground uh, thing. But the, the illuminated part, the, where the sun is shining from down here, where the sun is shining here, is where you get that crescent moon. And this is how the phases uh, take place. You have the crescent, the, court, the first quarter, and then you have the, the, the first quarter, the waning gibbous, waxing gibbous, then the last quarter. Last quarter and the waning crescent. You have a waxing crescent and the waning crescent. I hope that uh, you have waning crescent, waxing crescent, first, first quarter, last quarter, then you have uh, waning gibbous and waxing gibbous. Waxing gibbous goes towards the full moon, waxing gibbous, waning gibbous goes when you are past the full moon. When you crescent is when you are going back to a new moon. When the new moon now, when you are starting, becomes waxing. Yes. So this is the moon we shall see tonight. Okay. And uh, when it is a full moon, this is how it looks like. Some people say there is a woman in the moon. I don't know whether you can spot her. Let me put a clear one. You see a woman in the moon. I 
drew her there and uh, that's how she looks like. Does she make ring a bell? But some guys say, you know, they do not is Spanish. They said in their country they do not have, their women do not carry, uh, they are not fakers as our women. So I got annoyed and drew for him a cowboy and, uh, and uh, on the horse. But it, there, is no, there is nothing like a woman in the moon or a cowboy in the moon. It's an illusion. It's our imagination. It's when you imagine something and when you look at something, you, you want to see what you think or what you imagine. So eventually you have uh, this uh, uh, waning illus or waxing illus moon with this woman. And this is the moon we shall be able to see tonight. Maybe a bit larger, I can't hear. And it is a whole, a whole object like this, but because of the illumination on the stop in here, this is in a shadow, in a darkness, we wouldn't see it. And then uh, this is another you know, graphic to show you the moon, uh, the better part of the moon. Of the moon video to show how the moon evolved. Just a summary of what we have looked at. When the earth is away, okay, when the moon is between the sun and the moon, the light which hits here will be reflected back. We wouldn't see nothing. So we call it a new moon. Okay? So moon uh, uh, would, would look like this and you wouldn't see anything in the sky. But when the earth is between the moon, the sun, the rays come, if this is now, the sun rays are here, these countries here are in the day, we are in the night, you get all the reflected light from the moon, and you get the full moon. Okay? And uh, if this full moon sometimes can cause tides, and those tides can eventually spring up into the rain. In uh, 2011, there were a lot of uh, there were a lot of, uh, there was a super full moon, I think on March 18, and the Ministry of Disaster, and Disaster Preparedness had already issued the uh, SMSs that there will be, uh, it will be sunny, it will be hot, 
all of a sudden when it started, when it started very vigorously, it was because we had a super full moon and it caused those, those tides. And uh, if, if these three are in line, perfect line, that means that here, if these three are in a, in a perfect line, it means that this would create a shadow of the sun and the earth. And that's what we would call the eclipse. And if these were also in a line, it means that this would cast a shadow on this moon. And we would get a lunar eclipse. This would result into a solar eclipse. Solar coming from Sol means sun. Here you will get eclipse of the moon, which we call lunar eclipse, because lunar is a Greek word for the moon. And uh, sometimes, as the moon goes orbits around the earth, the sun, this earth, as the earth orbits around the, the sun, the, the orbit is not, the path is not perfect. Sometimes it goes far away, sometimes it goes near. And also, similarly, when the moon is going around the earth, sometimes it is near the, the moon is near the earth, sometimes far away. Implying that when it is near, it becomes huge, and that's what we call a perigee moon. And normally we call it a super full moon, it becomes so large. When it is far away, it is called the upper moon, and that upper moon is called the, uh, the, the, the mini moon sometimes. It becomes so small. But we don't normally take interest in looking at the skies and see whether there is any difference. And of course, these two points of the orbit where when the Earth is far away from the Sun, like this July, the Earth is far away from the Sun, we are in a, a, a period. It's July 2016. And uh, here, when the Earth is near, we, get, we call it a baby. This is the first and third quarter. This is how the moon looks like in those two quarters. And then we have people who are already plotting, making plots on the moon as we are on WhatsApp and chatting around. People are understanding these different creators and they are phones as a care, a batch one. So soon they will go and take all these places when they are still WhatsApp. So, but the, the, the ocean, you have oceanas, you have all these parts on the, uh, on the moon which are over there. And when the Apollo mission took place, it meant that uh, when astronauts went there, they looked at the blue ball in the sky, the way we look at the moon. And uh, they made uh, an exclamation that we came here to exp explore the moon, and hell no, we saw, we discovered the earth. So the earth also, you know, rises, becomes crescent, waxing crescent, becomes uh, first quarter, uh, becomes uh, waxing gibbous, becomes full earth, becomes uh, then uh, after full earth, then becomes smaller, goes to waning uh, gibbous, last quarter, then goes to being another crescent. But this photograph wasn't taken by astronauts, it was taken by a satellite which is orbiting the moon. So as it was rising like this, it took the surface of the earth, I mean of the moon, and the earth. This is another shot of the same thing. The Chinese landed their rover on the moon, and they are serious. They want to mine the moon. Probably they may shut it into pieces and disappear. And this is uh, their rover, and uh, the photograph was taken. Uh, another spot. So normally there is a question. Some people ask me. I normally give this presentation to make sure I I limit people who ask me funny questions. How do these do these robots go in space? They go in space using these kind of uh, rockets, uh, which are always launched on the launch pad. Or in another way, you can look at uh, the other one doing this form. And uh, this is a rocket being blasted off. 
This whole part here normally is full of fuel, just fuel for propulsion. But the actual payload or the actual contents which are being sent to space are just at the top here. But all this stretch here, the rocket stretch here, is for fuel, it's carrying kind of fuel. Then there is an example of the night launch. So this was a Apollo mission when they were in 1969. And this is another artistic impression of the Apollo mission, another artistic impression of the Apollo mission, another artistic impression of the Apollo mission, artistic impression of the Apollo mission. This is not artistic impression. This is real. This was live on CCTV, Chinese uh, cable, net, cable TV news, and it was live. So they were showing the robot going around and the surface of the moon. And uh, this is just to show you the orbit of the moon around the Earth is not is not a perfect uh, orbit. Sometimes you find it goes there, goes there. Until when it is in a straight line with the sun, and then you get an eclipse. This is uh, this was I think uh, Jupiter. This was uh, I don't remember which. And so this was a photo shared by some people to show the con conjunction of these three uh, objects. Maybe this was Mars. I don't remember. The word. This is called the Hubble telescope. It's a telescope which was launched into space to take photographs of deep space and search out for more planets. They, are also, they also launched the Kepler mission, which uses the Kepler laws. Kepler laws are that orbits move, I mean, sorry, planets move around the Earth and the Sun in the, in, and describe the path called an orbit. The time is, the squares of time is proportional to the tubes of the, uh, uh, tube, it is square, I think, to the tubes of the radius not radius, but the distance from swept by the, 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 the distance between the planet and the, the sun. And the other third one, there are three, the third one, I don't remember what it says. When you grew up in S5 S6, you were able to learn it. But the Kepler mission has done a tremendous job. It's, uh, this is the, 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 the eyepiece and the objective of the uh, Kepler mission. In these are panels to provide electricity for the uh, electronics we do. And a couple of uh, planets have been found out with that Kepler 62e, which is 0.82 of the Earth at one, Mars at 0.64, Neptune at, uh, and Jupiter is this whole Jupiter. So it, this is a comparison of the new discovered habitable or potential habitable exoplanets. Exo means that they are beyond our solar system. And this is uh, probably tonight we will be able to see this, uh, this Jupiter and its, this, uh, its moons. And we, we always look at Jupiter in the skies and think maybe it is a star. So is Mars. Mars also these days is up there in the sky, so we think that those are stars. The yellowish orange or reddish star you see that's Mars. On this other side, far away bit is what we call it. So we have the Sun, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Venus, Neptune, and then we should be having a group around there. And these are the moons associated with the different uh, planets. And this becomes our solar system. Planets look different. If you look at the, this, uh, the way they look, this one look, looks bluish, this looks uh, sky bluish, then you've got a combination of these desert fire places, blue waters, and then you've got the cloud competition, and as you cut it that way. The reason behind is because of the composition of these, of the gases formed on these planets. Okay? And these, uh, the gases which are found on these planets, they constitute the way the planet looks like. And that's why in this graphic, you have Venus looking this hot, you have the moon this white, Earth looking this way, Mars looking that way, and then you have Jupiter, Saturn, Mercury, 
the, the magnetic fields are coming from the north, they go here, they go there, they go here, they go here, they go here. Meaning that they create a sphere around the earth. That's why we say magneto. So we say magnetosphere, magneto is you have a magnetic field, but those magnetic fields are creating a sphere, so we call them magneto. So it means that uh, if you had the sun here, okay, if you had the sun here and it produces its wind, and this wind is a stream of uh, charged particles. In, in physics still, you find that we tell you that when you have a current moving in a conductor, which is being transported by positive charges, when these charges are moving, you get, if this is current direction, you get a magnetic field around that. Yes. So it means that if you have streaming, uh, streaming charged particles, then a magnetic field is created around them. When that magnetic field is created around them, that field, this field here, interacts with this field. That's why on comparison, on the comparison here, you have this being our this being our sun. And you have these part, these main parts of the particles which are produced. Sometimes we call them CMEs, corona mass ejections. Then they compress this other side of the of the magnetosphere. Whereas this part here, because of the streaming charged particles, gets elongated. So assume a girl is riding a bicycle and she has a lot of hair, or assume somebody is putting on a scarf. The scarf will be forced to fly behind. So comparatively, you will be able to get as this person goes around on the bike. The, 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 the hair or the scarf will be going back. Because we have the wind streaming from this side. Okay? So when that happens, then we get this kind of condition. That's so why we have SDO, Solar Dynamic Observatory, we have Icon, IMI, the Expander, uh, Van Allen Probes, Tennis, Winning, Amis, Jota, JAXA, this is Japanese, Spain, uh, IDS, Cell One, Solar OBS, ESA is. Uh, Space Agency, Solar Pump, Voyager, Soho, Solar, Heliospheric Observatory, for this is also for Independent Space Studio, RES, to mention that if you. All these are satellites sent to space and these all create jobs. There's somebody who has to analyze the photographs, somebody who has to analyze the data, somebody who has to keep monitoring it, and hence the jobs. So if you if we don't create those different revenues, like I was telling you, if you have a fence and somebody has to manure it, or is put fertilizers and manure, that's a job. But someone has to manufacture it, someone has to transport it, then someone has to trim it, has to buy a trimmer. Then someone has to manufacture trimmers. Then you create jobs. But you don't just say there are jobs to do what if you can't remove the place. You can't color out the place, so why are you going to get it up? Then, uh, uh, finally, you have uh, these rockets also, I mean, these uh, different satellites, or space called them, space, uh, space ships, we are launched, just like we, we launched the, um, the rover on uh, the moon of the Kegis to, uh, to the space station. And this is an example of the magnetic probes which are stored in the magnetosphere. This is the Earth. Yes, this is graphic. This is the Sun here. And they are trying to study the different properties of the magnetosphere. And this is a typical satellite which can be you can use the the, the, the fuel to readjust it into the orbit, but uh, most of the time it uses the, the solar panel. This inside here we have a transponder and electronics. 
and this is the cell life dish for the so we call it a cell life dish the one on the uh, on our houses and on our, on our banda and hotels and, and bars they are cell life dishes because they get information from the cell life so what happens is that this is the moon this is the earth so a station a tv station probably mtv will send its signals to the transponder of the, uh, of the cell light. So the, on the cell light, it has both capacity of receiving and transmitting. So it receives, then after receiving, then takes the people who need it. Because the cell light is so far above in space, it is able to send it to a given particular area. Previously, <coughs> We would, uh, what would happen in communication, especially the analog communication, is that a station like uh, MTV, or but let's use like UBC, which was the owner of the Corolla, of the Corolla mast, the, this would be, if we say this is Corolla, okay, if this is Corolla, and then we have the mast there at Corolla. Then we would have a transmitter on the mast of Corolla. And our earth has an atmosphere. And this atmosphere has layers. But the important layer is the ionosphere. Also coming from the word ions. Ion for ions and then a sphere of ions around the earth. Mm -hmm. So the, the station, UBC, or it used to be UTV, but UBC would send these signals into the ionosphere. But because the, these are ions, okay, so it means they are denser compared to this one which is less, less dense. Which one is denser? So have you started the total internal reflection? Yes. When does it happen? Uh, it occurs when the, the angle of incidence is greater than the critical angle. Yes, so but in which medium is the critical angle less? Is the, is the wave moving from dense to less dense or denser to less dense? It is moving from... Anyway, did, did I ever ask you the question of why do we get louder in the night compared during the day? Uh -huh. So in the night we have the, the, the air near the earth's surface having cooled down. And when it has cooled down, it has gone down, meaning that now the warm air is it up. So you have to be moving from, like a mirage. A mirage happens because the air near the surface is, is, is heated up. Immediately when it is heated up, it flies above and the cold air comes down. And uh, it means that total internal reflection happens from which medium to which medium? To less dense. That's what you think. Because the light ray is moving from, from the sun, which is up. But even if you don't go far, let's look at this scenario. This is the normal. And we are having, first of all, if you are moving from denser to less dense, okay? If you move, if you are within less dense, if you go crossing, where, do you, where, where does the... the where does the, the uh, emerging ray go? Towards the normal or away from the normal? Uh, away from the normal. So if you were here, it will go straight. If you were here, it will go straight without. If you turn here, a little bit here, it goes, so it means it keeps going this way until when you have gone past the, at the critical angle, when you are at sea. Yeah. Then it goes along the inner face. If you go past, if your eye becomes greater than C, then it means that you are now going to get total internal reflection. So yes, 
when it is moving for, uh, from, uh, from denser to less dense. So, as you get these waves going through the ionosphere, as the, the waves are about, of course, to cross the, the, I told you this one is, is more denser. These ions are more dense. So as it is about to cross to go above into the skies, if we drew a tangent here, then if this one is uh, above the critical angle, it comes back to the earth. And then we will, if it is a radio or if it is a TV, so it doesn't matter whichever it is. It could be a radio, okay, or it could be a TV. So that's how waves come back. That's how waves used to, to be transmitted in Anaba mm -hmm. using the ionosphere. And that's why when you will be listening to a, a, a short wave radio or medium wave, when it is raining, I don't know whether you have ever listened to a short wave radio, and soon people will not even know that there was analog TV where a picture will be having in the chair everywhere. So, but when the, when the, the lightning would, would flash, you would hear tsh, tsh, because you've tried now to interfere with the amount of ions there. Because lightning is an electricity. So, when it affects this, that's when you hear tsh. But when you use FM, frequency modulation, the thing comes from the station straight to the radio. Straight. That's why if you have a hilly place and if it is far away it won't reach so you have to reboost it. If you have capital FM, you go to Mbarada, they have to reboost it. Get a signal from here up to Mbarada, maybe transport it with, with the internet and then you broadcast it to the public. But then with the evolution of the of the satellite, the satellite sends a signal. So, in transmission of satellite signals, satellite signals are given a critical, I think, uh, above 3 gigahertz, and it, it is able to cross through the atmosphere with no problem, and goes to the, to the satellite, and then the satellite is able to also send it to the Consequences at one point. There are consequences that, as descending it back, if the ionosphere here is is enhanced, it will affect it. If you have a, a cloudy a, a cloudy condition, you see when it is cloudy, scatter. You see images freezing somehow. If it is raining, it's because of the the satellite signal failing to penetrate through the, the clouds comfortably. Yes. We have been talking about here the ionosphere. This is our ionosphere here. So if we have an event of space weather, that is when you have a big chunk of uh, charges coming from the coming from the, the sun, then this ions can affect the, the radio wave disturbance, they can cause disturbance. The earth currents can cause the pipeline to get a problem. The GPS stations can be affected from GPS to our GPS handheld receivers or in the car. The grid, our electricity grid can be affected and disrupted. Our optic fiber cables can get affected. Our pipeline, the, the pipeline of You've heard about the oil, mini can oil experiment that uh, a an oil uh, drop can be charged, can acquire charge. So if you have a pipeline with oil and you have charged particles moving around it, the oils can get the charge and get stuck to the walls. Eventually stick there and it becomes constrained, busts. The grid, it can overload the space weather can lead to overload of the grid and then you cause accidents, then you have rainfall water vapor causing high lightning, causing delay of the satellite immediately. Astronauts can be in problems. Then you, 
This all can affect our technologies. 150 million kilometers away from Earth, an outburst occurs on the surface of the Sun. In just a few seconds, it sends out a seething cloud of charged particles and super hot gases. This massive space weather front travels on the solar wind, a stream of material that constantly blows away from the Sun. When the storm front arrives at Earth, it energizes electrons and ions in our upper atmosphere. Our space weather. Our planet's atmosphere is a blanket of air that is thick near the surface and gets thinner the higher up you go. We live and travel through the troposphere, the lowest part. Next is the stratosphere, which contains the ozone layer and high thin clouds. The mesosphere is where we see incoming meteors burn up. Above that is the ionosphere, an electrified region where space weather has its greatest effect. Haystack researchers analyze how the ionosphere is affected by the solar wind. They also measure how it interacts with the magnetosphere, the region of space around Earth that is influenced by our magnetic field. The sun is the source of all the space weather that buffets the ionosphere and magnetosphere. Like every other star in the universe, it is an active seething sphere of hot gas. When a cloud of gas and charged particles, called a plasma, escapes from the sun, we find out about it pretty quickly. The light from the outburst reaches our planet in about eight and a half minutes. The plasma takes longer. It usually arrives within two to three days and collides with our magnetic field. That action sparks huge electrical storms high in the ionosphere and creates blazing displays of northern and southern lights. Space weather can have more serious consequences. In March 1989, a series of solar disturbances triggered violent geomagnetic storms they knocked out the power for more than six million people across eastern Canada. For that reason, researchers want to understand space weather and how it can affect people and technology here on Earth. An idea of the physical state of the ionosphere. We can use this information to track changes in the ionosphere and relate it to changes in the solar wind and other space weather events. These days, we've added a new instrument to our ionospheric study toolkit, GPS. Global positioning system satellites continually relay radio signals to ground receivers. Those signals contain timing information and data about the satellite's locations. That information is then analyzed and turned into other data that can be used by airplanes and boats for navigation. Automobile GPS systems also use the same information to help drivers find their destinations. Banks and financial institutions depend on precise GPS signals to help them transfer money on time. And every cellular telephone network relies on GPS timing data. So how can space weather affect all of these systems? Solar storm fronts rapidly push clouds of ions and electrons into small regions of the ionosphere. This interferes with broadcast signals from communication satellites and radio signals from the GPS satellite network. Solar storms can also stir up strong electrical currents that could overload power grids and shut off the lights for millions of people. If communication networks and power companies have enough advance warning, they can take steps to protect their systems until the storm is over. During such solar storms, ships and airplanes can switch to other navigation methods until reliable GPS signals are available. Today at Haystack Observatory, we're using GPS data collected during solar storms to better understand how space weather changes our ionosphere. What we learn by analyzing the data together from our radar antennas and GPS units is of immense importance. Space weather isn't just out there. It affects us right here on Earth.
What we call space weather. Conditions around the sun that affect the technologies in space and on Earth and can even uh, cause death. This is another way of doing photography with the moon, with the plant. And I told you on one of the occasions that is between the sun and the moon, the, the shadow cast by the earth can land on the moon and cause a cloud on the moon. We are done. We are done with this moon, uh, moon viewing. Uh, so this is what I normally show people before I take them out on, on the telescope. And then when we go to the telescope, they know what they are looking after. Have you learned it?